uh, that was the worst. Amen. That was probably the worst thing I ever did was buying that property without getting, without just asking somebody. <laughs> Welcome to our show. I'm excited to have Jordan Lee here with us today. Uh, Jordan Lee is an investor extraordinaire, an excellent salesperson, uh, a good friend. I'm, I'm just really excited to, to come out and see what he has to share and, and just go into it. We're going to hash out some numbers. We'll talk a little bit about his, his story, his experience, how he got there, some of the mindset that go, went into it. And then at the end, we're going to go in and we're going to hash out numbers. We might debate a little bit. Um, we'll see how agreeable Jordan is, and then uh, <laughs> and then we'll move on from there. So thanks for coming out, Jordan. No problem, man. Um, let me start out. So how did, how did you get involved in, in real estate investing? I guess, let me stop there. Mm -hmm. And then when was it that you knew that you wanted to invest in real estate? And then we'll get into how you got involved. Um, I think I knew I wanted to invest in real estate when I was like five, just because my grandpa did it. And I, you know, Every Christmas when he would get you the nice gift, you'd be like, wow, he's probably doing well for himself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I wanted to do it as early as, you know, as, as I could, you know, 18 years old, I, I wanted to get in real estate, but it's hard because you need the, the tax history, right? And you need the down payment. So at first I wasn't, you know, I didn't know how to get into it until I went out and got my own money. So it took me a while, but... I mean, I've always wanted to be in real estate, so. Pretty good deal. Yeah, so. And how did you get started, right? I know you do, you went and did sales of Vivint, you reprint right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I know you started doing there. They have the best clothing line, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so talk to me a little bit about that. How did, how did you end up deciding, okay, you know, with the money I make, yeah. instead of buying fancy watches, fancy cars, mm -hmm. I know you agree with me, I think we both live well beneath our means mm -hmm. and that's that's how we have money to invest if mm -hmm. not we wouldn't <laughs> for sure but tell me a little bit about how you guys purchased your first home and what that one looked like um well to be honest real quick just uh to tell you something that vivant has been a big, huge blessing in my life right and i think i was really blessed to learn that it's possible to make a good amount of money right so um when i was right out of college i was approached and i got the job Right. And my first year I came home from the summer, I made a decent amount. I learned quickly that I wouldn't qualify for anything because I only had one week of or one year of work history and I wasn't a W2 employee. So, you know, I didn't need the six months. I need the two years. So my goal, my second year at Vivint was to make enough money to either qualify for a house or go get a house. Right. Well, I made enough money, but I made a mistake year two, and I wrote too much stuff off. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote off so much stuff that even though I had a hundred grand in a bank account after two years of doing the summers and just extra money, because let's be honest, I lived at Glenwood. I think rent was like two two hundred and twenty bucks a month. Yeah. I had no expenses. I had a full ride scholarship to BYU. Um, I mean, I had extra money, so. But I made the mistake of not uh, claiming enough on taxes. So thankfully, I was able to, I had enough money to go buy a home cash. But going back in time, I never would have done that. I would have done a completely different, I would have waited an, another year and see what I qualify for and put, you know, 5% or 20% down on an owner occupied. But so I messed up on my first property. It was probably the biggest mistake I've ever made in my entire life. Luckily, um, the house appreciated over a hundred grand within three years. So I got lucky. We bought a good house. Yeah. Um, I bought it for two thirteen. I went 50, 50 on it with a brother of mine and it, we sold it for like three twenty. So. And yeah. I know the house, so I know yeah. the buyers got actually a decent deal on that. And they did. They got a good deal. We gave them 15 grand below market value. Yeah. So. Um, partly because we didn't have to use realtor, right? So, mm -hmm. and we just want to give them a good deal, owner finance it, so they didn't have to take a loan. But uh, yeah, that was the, probably the worst actually mis thing I ever did in real estate was looking back. Yes, I made a killing off of it as far as appreciation, but I much rather would have done what I'm doing now and use the leverage. And once it 
clicked in my brain the power of leverage uh i won't ever go back well from what i've been doing now yeah yeah okay yeah i, I want to do another video uh at another time where we go in and we, we analyze the numbers on that house and yeah that, and how it ended up playing out and how much more you would have made if you would have not paid cash for it a ton so, i've already kind of done it yeah so yeah it's 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 a lot more no no of course yeah, I'm, I'm kind of running the numbers. I was like, okay, well, if you would have done a 5% down since you were owner-occupying, then you could have had the same amount of appreciation, but 5% down of that would have been $10,000 instead of a hundred grand. Yep. And if you would have done the same thing and gone half and half with your, your brother on that, mm -hmm. then it would have been just $5,000. Yep. Then you would have had $90,000 to plug into another property that would have appreciated the same. Correct. <laughs> It would have it would have been a lot different. So uh, that was the worst. That was probably the worst thing I ever did was buying that property without getting without just asking somebody, "Hey, will you co-sign with me?" Um, or, "Hey, you know, can I use your income? I have the cash. You have the credit and the work history. Let's combine together." Because there's people that don't have money. They have credit and they have work history, but they don't have money. So if you can bring the money and they can bring the credit. Or you can partner with people. I mean, there's people out there that want to do that with you. And at the time, I was just like, I don't know. I want to do this on my own. You know, so that was a huge mistake in purchasing a property cash. So, but, you know, I still made money off of it. I bought that one in December of 2014. So I, I literally graduated. It was like on a Wednesday on like the 18th. And we're driving back to Reno on the like the 19th on a Thursday. Um, and I don't know if it was like the exact days, but I remember I took my last final on a Wednesday. And on Thursday, we were supposed to drive back to Reno for Christmas. On the way back, we stopped at American Fork to look at this house. It was listed for 213 or 219 and we knew it was a deal. We looked at all the other properties. We're like, wow, like 219 for this place is a, is a steal. Um, just five bedrooms, uh, three and a half bathrooms, really nice and we got it down to 213 with all the appliances they left everything we negotiated that and you know fast forward to 2019 so you know four four years four months later we you know we made a hundred and about a hundred and eight eight grand profit off a two hundred and thirteen thousand dollar investment so it was it was a good return but like I said, I love leverage, and I'll never go back. I, I wish I could go back, and do that as a leveraged property. No, of course. And then something else that Jordan does that I want to touch on briefly, is is the amount of, I guess how how frugal you are with your money, right? Because I know you yeah you didn't just live there. You're like okay, cool. I've got a five bedroom, three bath house. I'm gonna kick mm -hmm. in just myself and have my bachelor pad or whatever like. Like, yep. Let's let's go into what you did and how you had that rented out. So I'll be honest. I always wanted to have a house before I had a car. So I I walked to school. I was very frugal with my money. I knew I wanted a house. So like even when I was in college, I it, when I made my first I think my first year at Vivint, I wasn't the best salesman in the world. I still made about forty grand, and uh, I didn't use almost like any of that. So when we bought the property though, since we had no mortgage on it, uh, we rented out, my brother and I took two bedrooms and the three extra bedrooms we charged, you know, about $400 a room. So we we're making an extra $1,200 plus utilities. They paid the utilities. Yeah, great. So the only expense we had was the HOA, which was about 180 bucks. I think right now it's gone up like 20 bucks, but we had $180 of expenses the rest, the utilities and twelve hundred dollars of income till essentially until March of this year. So yeah, it was awesome. And I and I could have gone out and bought a fancy car or this or that, but I never bought anything expensive. I mean, my first car was a Kia. Right now I drive a Honda. Um, I mean I if I can get a cheap car off of Facebook I'll do it because it just seems to do its job. Um the fact that I have an Apple Watch is just because I love music, you know, and I just want to have, like, access to it in the gym. But I don't buy fancy clothes. I don't buy fancy shoes. I don't buy fancy cars because my dream is to travel the world. 
and I know if I have residual income, that's where I get my happiness is traveling and people give me energy. I love good relationships uh, and that's expensive. So I want to be able to have a good amount of money to go do that. Yeah. So. Well, you don't have to pay me to be your friend, Jordan. I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll do it for free. Um, okay. And that's great. And well, tell me about along the journey you, you got married. Yeah. So tell me, did that, how did that influence how you were investing? Um, it didn't. Uh, the fact that I'm married has, she's totally on the same page as me. Yeah. She knows that. Sorry. Yeah. Pro tip right there. I mean, <laughs> to invest, be on the same page as your partner. If not, it's going to be a mess. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of spouses out there that are very conservative, you know. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day, they're like, yeah, my wife, um, if I was to buy a million dollar property and we have a debt on, let's say, 800000 she would be very scared of that. Like, oh my gosh, what if it's vacant or we can't make the payments? For me, um, I, I have told my wife that we talked about this. If I bought a $5 million property and a ma- astronomical amount of debt and I lost on it and, you know, the property was taken from me or I had to declare bankruptcy, I wouldn't care. I wouldn't care because tomorrow I can wake up and go sell an alarm system. I've sold solar. I've sold outdoor kitchens, for heaven's sake. I made five grand in two days going to a conference in uh, Salt Lake. I know I have the sales ability. And so making money has never been a problem. Um, that's like the beauty that Vivint taught me is like my first week in sales, I made a $3,500 paycheck in four working days. And I, I got, I maybe got lucky, right? Like we went into it's a little town, but uh, I have, you know, as far as like risking it all, I don't care. So when I got married, I taught my wife the power of leverage and I said, hey, you're all, something my mission president taught me, I'm LDS and served a mission, I mean, he was an accountant. Um, in a, one of the leadership conferences, he said, you're only worth as much as you can borrow. So who's worth more, the guy that's $10 million in debt or the guy that has a million dollars in the checking account? Well, it depends. If it's $10 million of good debt that's paying off by tenants, that guy's way richer. Because in 30 years from now, that $10 million property could be worth $15 million and it's all paid off, where the million dollar guy might only be able to acquire a $5 million property. So for me, it's all about how much debt can I get into. Um, if I can get the more debt, the better. That's how I look at it. Good deal, good deal. And there is, there is a lot of argument on both sides, and I appreciate you bringing your insight on that. Honestly, yeah. the more leverage you have, the way the numbers play out, in general, you your money's working for you more. Mm-hmm. The downfall is that. I mean, you have to come to grips with, hey, if I over leverage, I might lose something. If, are you okay with that? If that's a risk you want to take, then, <laughs> then you know, cheers. And then you can go out and do that. Yeah. But I know at the same time, I know how you buy, so there is ways to leverage maybe a little bit more that I don't, I don't recommend. The way you're buying, honestly, I, I'm in agreement in most cases. Mm-hmm. Um, so Jordan typically buys, you want to talk a little bit about that and how you typically buy? So, yeah, uh, I try to own or occupy, right? So if I can get, um, so let's say I was going on to an investment, if I want to get a co-signer or something, I'd have somebody own or occupy it or, or myself own or occupy it and get the lowest down payment. So um, anyway, let's just say I moved into my units when I bought my unit so I could get a lower down payment um, and also a lower interest rate and I believe in moving every year. So like we're moving to Saratoga this year, guaranteeing like next year we'll move again so I can put 5% down on another property. But I believe in moving. Like that's, I I believe in owner occupying, put the least money down and have the lowest interest rate. Of course. And that's your residential side, right? Yeah. I know you don't just invest in residential properties. Do you mind going into your commercial or your multifamily units and how? Yeah. Because the, re- the reason I want to talk about this is because there are ways and folks, they get hard money loans that are very, very difficult to pay off. And then they get into, yeah. into properties with that. And then they're ridiculously over leveraged. They get hard money as their down payment, mm-hmm. which, I mean... It's tough because they have to leave it in their account for two months for the, the bank to loan on it, but they can do it that way. They have it set up 
and then their interest rates become hard to manage and they're like, but my money's working for me. But, and then any shift in the economy and like they're done. Yeah. So I know you don't do it that way and that's why I want to go into a little bit of how you do it. Yeah, so um, I would love to use the whiteboard for this part. Of course. Yeah, can I show you an example? Of course. We'll, okay. be, we'll be right back. Your next clip will be the okay. whiteboard. All righty. So we're back. Um, we just <laughs> we kind of took a little a little break to go on and, and doodle on the board and crunch a couple of numbers. Jordan's going to go into the difference between leverage as opposed to paying cash, and and then we're just going to kind of hash out the details there. And then I'm going to make a couple add-ons to what he's saying. Um, we're keeping it a little simpler on purpose, but I'll just let you guys know that you can get a little more complicated, and the numbers are actually more favorable if you do an even more real-life scenario. But yep. I'll go ahead and let you jump into awesome. it. Awesome. So, yeah, just preface, uh, my whole strategy is I love to leverage. So when I learned the power of leverage, and for, for those who are watching this, um, leverage is using assets that aren't yours to go make money. So essentially using the bank's money to go make money. And in these two examples, the two examples I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give option one, where you're buying cash. And if you wanna take out a notepad and pen, follow along, I'll try to go slow, but also try to explain it pretty well. And option two is leveraging. So using bank money or you know a loan, whoever you can get it from, to go out and get more land or real estate or whatever you will, any real property. So. In this example, we're gonna start. We're gonna say you have a hundred thousand dollars. So, grandpa gives you a hundred grand, or maybe you went out and made a hundred grand by yourself. Um, you have a hundred thousand dollars, and we're saying that this is gonna be a thirty-year play. So you're gonna invest your money. You're never gonna touch this for thirty years, and in thirty years you have a retirement plan. You know you're twenty-five years old, and you want to go invest some money into real estate. So, option one, with your hundred grand. Um, let's say you listen to mom and dad and there's ah Don't get yourself in debt Just go buy a house and get rent and play it safe and that's fine. You know some people do that Okay, not, not mom and dad. I mean the one who Dave Advocates Ramsey. this the biggest one is Dave, Dave Ramsey, Ramsey. Um, mm -hmm. So this, this is this is us versus Dave Ramsey. Here yeah, <laughs> so so I and I hate this and I'll, I'll show you guys why so you go buy a house for a hundred grand, okay? Every year, um, let's say you're getting about 8% in rent. So you have a pretty nice unit. It's fixed up. It's 100 grand. Um, let's say you're getting 8% of the value of the house. So that's the cap rate, okay? So you're getting $8,000 a year in rent, which would mean you're charging $667. Say it's a single family home in Louisiana, a really, really cheap house, right? Say yeah. 667 bucks a month for 12 months over 30 years. So over a 30 year period, you're gonna collect $240,000 of rents. Okay, not too bad, right? So you haven't touched that. Um, that should actually grow, right, with interest even on the bank or if you're reinvesting that, we're not gonna get into that, okay? But you're investing 240, you're, you've made $240,000 off of rents in 30 years, okay? Also, this house, you didn't have a mortgage on, um, and it's just gone up at 3%, let's say. And I know it's a little bit less than that realistically, but... It's actually a little more. Or Sorry, yeah, a little bit more. It goes up a little bit more. Um, but let's say it just goes up at 3%. We're being very conservative, okay? At the end of 30 years, your property is going to be worth 242000 okay? So you've almost made the same amount of rents as you, your appreciation, like the value where you could sell it at. So if you add these two together, 242 and 240 you get $482,846. So you, you, you invest at 100 grand. At the end of 30 years, you have $482,000. So essentially, over a 30 year period, you've made $382,000. And a lot of people would be like, wow, that's actually pretty good. $382,000 off 100 grand, you know, over 30 years. But it's not. It's not good at all, actually. So if you leverage, you can actually go out and get five houses. Let's say you're, you're getting them to where you can get them 20% down, okay? So some houses, maybe you get five, or some you get 20%, or some you get 25. But in this case scenario, we're just gonna say every house, you're getting 20% 20, 20 down. So 20 grand per house, and your mortgage is gonna be 80 grand. So on each mortgage, 
Um, the actual mortgage would be like 350 bucks, let's say, but we're gonna say 500 with uh, insurance and property taxes, okay? So this, for simplicity purposes, you're paying a $500 mortgage payment on five houses, okay? Now, you're gonna be charging the same amount of rents. These are all equal houses, so five houses, you're getting $667 each month, but you're also paying a $500 mortgage payment. So the difference is $167 a month on five houses, okay? So your net profit is gonna be $835 a month, okay? We following? And it's a lot of math, but yeah. essentially on, prop on this option one, you're making 667, you don't have any expenses. Actually, we didn't even calculate uh, property tax and insurance on this one, but even better, right? So mm -hmm. um, let's say you're only making $835 net on this, but in realistic, you're actually going to be even making more because we didn't even calculate uh, insurance or property taxes on this. This is just pure profit. But for all intents and purposes, if you were to times 835 times 12 months times 30, you're going to make 300 grand in rents. So as to where you made $240,000 in rents over 30 years on this $100,000 property, you're making $300,000 on the five properties. Mm -hmm. The beauty of it is you've also paid off five properties that are all worth $242,726. Okay? So essentially you have $1.2 million of property. So if you went and sold all your property, here, you'd have made 482000 Here, you've made the rents plus what the property is worth. So you've made $1.5 million. So in summary, if you were to leverage five properties 20% down, on just $100,000, you'd make at least, and this is very conservative numbers, actually like almost too conservative, um, you'd make at least a million dollars more on your investment over a 30 year period. That's right. Yeah. And I'm gonna come in and just talk about a couple different areas where the numbers, we're doing it si simply on purpose to make sure that, I mean, if we, <laughs> if we went in and did all the numbers, we need a board three times as long. Time value of money on this. Yeah. Inflation rate on your guys' rents. Exactly. Depreciation on five properties as opposed to one. Exactly. So we, we talk about in a lot of our videos, right, the way money's made in real estate. I'll just buzz through it real quick. One, appreciation. My, my handwriting is going to be terrible, so I'm just writing for myself more than anyone. Rents. Right. So we're, we're going to call it debt payoff, right? And then right, that's how much your mortgage is being paid off by other, other people. So that's working for you as well. And three, yes, your rents, your cash flow, right? So although the rents are much higher on this side, you have other expenses, but the cash flow even there ends up being higher. So your cash flow and then your tax advantages. The two big ones is depreciation, which you can count on both properties. But another one is on the, the building itself, you can write off your, excuse me, that is the depreciation. But you can also write off the interest that you're paying on this interest, yeah. on the, on the loan that you have in there. So it's your interest. And then if we're really going nitpicky on your cash flow, then you want to start incorporating your capex, right? So the big, really big expenses, and then you want to go into your maintenance fees, um, just little things that happen with time, and you kind of calculate those out. Yep. And then either your property management fees. I always calculate them, even though. You're, even if you're self-managing, I think it makes sense to see that because I think eventually you want to hand that off to somebody else. Or and know that they can afford it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Make sure that the, the, those are some of the, the variables that you look at when you're analyzing a property. But even then, like I said, every time that uh, appreciation goes up, the rent is either right behind it, sometimes ahead of it, sometimes 100% in line, but they pretty much end up being the same. So this $667... I mean, it goes up. That could be a thousand dollars in year thirty, and you're collecting a thousand dollars on one house, or five grand on the five houses every yeah. month. Let's say, let's say it turns in. I mean, if we're using an eight percent cap at that one, then it's even higher than a thousand. But let's just say a thousand. Yeah. 
right, one and thousand, and then at that point your cash flow here is just one thousand a month. Your cash flow once they're all paid off is five thousand a month. Correct. But again, you really want to see what your money did for you. At the end of the day, a hundred thousand dollars over those thirty years turned into four hundred and eighty-two thousand eight hundred and forty-six. Right. Mm -hmm. That same one hundred thousand dollars turned into one point five million. 5 million. Uh, so that's that's the important thing to get into. Again, I'm not going to go absolutely crazy on the numbers and analyze that and X, Y, Z. Um, so, yeah, and I just want to say I'm, I'm like the living proof of this. Um, you know, I, I've bought a couple properties, a little bit bigger scale than this. Um, but, you know, they're, they're paying themselves off. And I'm taking, I don't spend any of that money. So this rent money, the extra, you know, $835 a month in this, in this scenario, I go and I put that into more real estate. So if you were to put this into more real estate, you could do the same thing over and over every three years using this money as it's accrued to do a down payment on another property. And eventually it's just, it's exponential growth. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's, anyway, we're going to try to keep it simple. Um, I know I've lost some of you guys. The point is leverage works. But make sure it's done correctly, right? Because if you if you if you over leverage, and there's any shift in the market, then you and you don't have any income to, to take care of that, or you don't have any emergency fund or anything like that, mm -hmm. then that is when I mean you get a real good kick in the pants. Yep. But if you're finding right properties that are cash flowing correctly, the issue, the where the reason a lot of people lost money in the last downturn, is because they all wanted that appreciation, which is an awesome number but they weren't concerned about the cash flow. So if those, cash, if those properties aren't cash flowing, then a shift in the economy will hit you really hard. But if you keep your expenses really low on your personal base, so you're not eating up that extra Any cash flow. Any of the extra cash flow. Then, I mean, you can do a lot of different things, right? And if you are house hacking, which you can do like 5% down, but then you have to look at mortgage insurance. But the faster you pay that, that off, then the faster you can get rid of your mortgage insurance and increase the amount of money that, that's actually in your pocket at the end of the day because it will cash flow better. Uh, so anyway, those are a couple of things to look at. In real life in Utah, this number is closer to 300000 Yep. And everything else is kind of multiplied by three. Uh, it is, it's very hard to find an 8% cap rate. I mean, just kind of averages that you're seeing. Um, I, I see typically between four and six. But there are... In the, Utah. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. And you can find, you can find some that do a little bit better. You can, there's a lot out there that do a little, little bit worse, um, but it, it is finding those properties, analyzing them, seeing your own financial situation, and, and that's why you, you, you need to do your homework. The properties, it's not a, a little investment. You want to make sure you know your stuff, and that's kind of why we're here. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who are going to sell you a $10,000 course to, to just go over exactly what we talked about mm -hmm. here. That's not my intention. I want to give back freely and let you guys take advantage of that and take advantage of good people like Jordan who come in and also openly give out his, his knowledge. Yeah. Um, you do kind of the same thing here. You did 20% down owner occupying on a fourplex yep. once, and then you did it again. Mm -hmm. Now you're doing it again with a house. Kind of and another fourplex. And another fourplex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you'll do it in another fourplex. And then a 16. But, yeah, it's, it's growing, so... <laughs> I know, at the end of the day, this is going to be how many properties you have. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and it, honestly, I just want to say, if, if any of you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to email me or text me. Um, my email is jordanleerealestate at gmail.com. So super easy if you have any real estate questions. Um, my phone number is 775-830-8094. I mean, seriously, feel free to ask me any questions. I'll, I'll tell you who I use for lenders who I use for my appraisers, like it, it, whatever you guys want as far as like how to build your assets a little bit further, you can text me any question. I'm an open book. Yeah. I would yeah. go through my personal financials with you, but you got to know me. So if you call, I'll show you some actual, <laughs> some actual numbers and it'll blow your mind. So yeah. yeah. And uh, we're not going to go back and sit down. Jordan's got to get going. I want to milk him for as much time as I can though. Um, so my question is this, is what is your overall strategy for the long run? Yeah. This, this is kind of my strategy that I, that I am going to take, take advantage of mm -hmm. isn't, isn't the way that your money is working for you as much as possible. It's a pretty leveraged route in the beginning. 
Mm -hmm. And then you end up actually paying off the properties. If you wanted to keep leveraging these, honestly, you don't you don't ever actually pay. So you off. ask me what you, my long term strategy is. You turn around. Cool. Uh -huh. but this, my long term strategy is simple. I'm gonna buy properties um, super leveraged, at least amount that I can possible. Um, I want to pay them off when they appreciate more. I will either refinance or take a home home equity line of credit. Um, and go just buy more properties. I want to be so much, by the time I, I die, I want to have over a billion dollars of debt. Yeah. Like I, I love debt. Cause if it's, you know, if it's, if it's billion dollars debt, but it's paying 1.1 billion in rents, you know, then you're making 0.1 billion dollars a year. That'd be amazing. hundred million. Yeah. yeah. So a hundred million dollars a year. Um, at the rate I'm going, I, uh, I'm getting close to my goal, which my goal is, 56,000. I, I, I'm weird. I went through with a guy named Eric Sprouse a long time ago. We were selling and we went through and looked at all of our, our dream, our dream home, you know, just our dreams, motor home, boat, everything. And if I was living the most luxurious lifestyle, we calculated it to the penny. It'd be about $56,000 a month where I could have anything like literally stupid amounts of spending money. Um, and if I were to do this model um, and just buy a couple quadplexes where let's say you know, I have 56 units that are all paying, or let's say 50 units that are paying a little bit over $1,000 a month, I'm done. Okay, so my, my goal is to get about 50 units. So I think maybe we're not in as much disagreement as I might have thought. So some folks, is that's, they want that cash flow number to be there. Here's, here's kind of how I calculate it. Um, Sorry, man, just killing the work of art here. But th this is my overarching strategy, and this is what I think is, is feasible for a lot of people. It's mm -hmm. finding out what your monthly number is, right? So say yours is 56K, mm -hmm. not 5K, 56. Yeah. Say somebody else is 10K. Mm -hmm. Let's just go ahead and, and be conservative with that number. Yeah. Um, so 10K, and say on average a $300,000 property, you can get 2,000 a month. I'm just, yeah. these aren't actual numbers. I mean, they're, they're, they're close to actual numbers, yeah. but I'm going to be conservative. Um, and right, so the goal is 10,000. Honestly, if that's the goal, it really needs to be 12,000 because what you're looking at is you want someone else to manage it for you. You want to make sure you have something to pay off the, uh, the expenses that come along with the property. So let's just say it's really six houses is how much you need. So honestly, you can go in. This is crazy. This is where it's crazy. And this is where I want to make it so simple for anyone else to do it and for just your average Joe to do it. You can go in and you can buy a house. You can do, honestly, you can do 3% down in a conventional loan, and then a 3.5% down, then a 5%, 5%, 5%. But let's just say 5% for all of them, right? So those six properties. 5% mm -hmm. on that, that's 15,000, 15,000 times six. You're looking at 90,000 is your overarching investment is all you need to put in there. You just... Do 15000 once a year. Live cheap, 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 cheap. Buy a house, buy a house, buy a house, buy a house, buy a house. And then you're at that point where you have those six properties that are making 2000 a month is, is what they rent for, right? And then maybe the mortgage on that because you are doing lower down payments. Once you pay off the mortgage insurance, maybe you're looking at 1500 right? And then you have $500 extra a month per property times that by the six. And you have 3000 extra per property. That 3000 extra per property this is where I say, where I think ours ours may vary a little bit. Mm -hmm. The next game is how fast, now that I've acquired the ones I need, how fast can I pay them off so I get that monthly number? So I never want to, my strategy, I'll never pay off properties. When I get to 15 years, if I own 75% of the property, I'm refinancing it, taking out the money to go put a down payment on another property. Mm -hmm. I never want to own properties free and clear, mm -hmm. ever. So, and, and financially, it makes sense. Yeah. The, the reason I, pay, I, I talk about it this way is because some folks need to see an end in mind. And mm -hmm. honestly, I, I talk about this, yeah. I think once I'm down the line, if I see a good deal and I've got some equity in the properties, I'll just pull the trigger, right? But regardless, the, this, this, this theory, it makes sense in theory, right? And and if you really want to get into detail, I'll go on another video. But uh, I'd be 1031 exchanging all my properties. 100%. So, um, you know... If uh, my, I get a property for, let's say, let's say, let's be like realistic. This is about what I'm searching for right now. It's about million dollar properties. So if I'm paying 200 grand down into them 
and in 15 years, um, I don't know how much you'd pay towards the $8,000, $800,000 mortgage. Honestly, don't know that number off the top of my head, but let's say you'll, you have $500,000 of equity in it, but the property has gone up to 1.5 million. Mm -hmm. Well, you only owe $500,000 off of it. So you can essentially take out a million dollars to go do another thing. So I'd, I'd either HELOC it and take out 70, uh, 75, 80% of the equity in it to go do a down payment, or I'd refinance it, take the extra money and go. Um, but really there is no end in mind for me because why would you ever stop? Even if I was 75, I'm really looking for living off the residuals. I'm never going to sell these properties. Mm -hmm. If I'm ever going to sell the property, I'm going to put it into a bigger property. Exactly. Like just a down payment into a bigger property. I mean, when I die, I've told my wife, if she gets a million dollars on my life insurance policy or whatever it may be, there's no way she's going to buy a ca an apartment building cash with that. Yeah. She's going to put 25% down on a $4 million unit. And in 15 years, she's going to either HELOC it and put another down payment, or she's going to refinance it and go into a bigger thing. Because mm -hmm. that's what she's going to live off of. You know? Of course. So, but if you do want an end in mind, and this is where I, I am just going to go and do it real quick, you take that extra 3000 a month that's being generated through that. You Obviously, the, the other ones are paying themselves off, and you have that go through. And at 3000 a month, $300,000 payment, um, plus it's getting paid off by the, the tenant. Then you can, you can honestly pay off the first one in less than six years. Then the next one, because this number is now 2000 a month, plus, anyway, then that rolls into the other one. And in probably two or three years, that one's paid off. Then this one a year, a year, less than a year. And then, and then you're, you're, you're theoretically, if you want to be done and you just, all you want, again, it really depends on what the yeah, goal you get, is. You can pay them off quicker and get a higher return every month because you have no debt. Mm -hmm. But that's not, that's not my personal goal. If I live to 100 years old, I want to be in as much debt as possible because I know that my heirs, my family, will inherit that property and that will be residual for them to grow. Forever. Um, if it's not, gro if you're not growing, you're dying. So I just believe that, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I don't believe in paying off properties. I don't think I ever will pay off a property. If it's ever getting close, I'll sell it and put it towards a bigger property. So yeah. I, I actually got to go. No worries. But I, I think I'm actually yeah. the same to be honest there. But for anyone who does want just a very basic strategy, then that, that is probably what I would recommend, is yeah. get them in, get them knocked out, and then you're at 10K. At 10K a month, you can go out and live in the Canary Islands and live a very, very easy life. That's your dream, dude. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, thanks, thanks again, Jordan, Thank for you. coming in. I uh, appreciate you taking your time out, and I uh, hope this has been beneficial for you guys. I know we were a little back and forth on a couple of things, and hope it was okay to follow. But bottom line is that, is, is learn your numbers, learn how they, they make sense for you, and then what your overarching goal is to reach that. Um, if you guys have any questions, again, Jordan's given his information out freely. Mine's always there. You're welcome to DM me on Instagram, shoot me a message on Facebook Messenger, uh, email me, whatever it is. I'm happy to help with whatever I can. So thanks so much, and again, I appreciate you guys watching the video.